Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Rail Splitter Athletics Report. It's hard to believe 2014-15 is now officially uh, almost behind us after tonight's show. It will be. Uh, this is the final show of 2014-15 season, and we're going to talk about all 17 Lincoln Memorial University athletic sports and how they fared this year. We'll start with the fall, go through the winter, and end with the spring. Scott Erland of the Lincoln Memorial University Sports Information Office is going to be joining us tonight to talk about the seasons of all the LMU athletic teams, about how they fared, and about what's ahead in the future for Lincoln Memorial University Athletics. A lot to talk about tonight, to say the least. Uh, as far as I know, right now, all LMU athletic teams are complete. I know uh, Braden Gallion of the Lincoln Memorial University men's golf team was in action earlier this week. Uh, I don't know if round play has uh, finished on that or not, but uh, we will talk to Scott Erland about that. He'll be able to bring us up to date a little bit more on that situation and let us know how he finished. So we're going to take this break. When we come back, we'll get things started. You're locked into the Rail Spreader Athletics Report. We have a big problem and we need your help. It's happening on college campuses, at bars, at parties, even in high schools. It's happening to our sisters and our daughters. Our wives and our friends. It's called sexual assault and it has to stop. We have to stop it. So listen up. If she doesn't consent or if she can't consent, it's rape, it's assault. It's a crime, it's wrong. If I saw it happening and I was taught, you have to do something about it. If I saw it happening, I speak up. If I saw it happening, I'd never blame her. I'd help her. Because I don't want to be a part of the problem. I want to be a part of the solution. We need all of you to be part of the solution. This is about respect. It's about responsibility. It's up to all of us to put an end to sexual assault. And that starts with you. Because one is too many. affects one in every three women in America, but you can fight back. There's no time to lose. Mothers, sisters, daughters, families, and friends, it's time to shout louder, stand stronger, and demand change. Let's go! To the Batmobile! Dang it. To the invisible jet! Dang it. Together, we can put an end to heart disease. It's time to go red for women. I could use your help. Yeah! Learn more from the American Heart Association at www.goredforwomen.org. You love your car or truck? Let us help you keep it clean at Soapy J's. Soapy J's has unlimited wash plans to fit every budget. Try our $5 express wash or one of our three monthly wash plans. The wheel deal, the Soapy J, or the new Blast Wax. With our monthly wash plans, if you pay with credit card, all you do is pay for the present month and your card will be billed on the first of each month. Don't forget, Soapy J's has free vacuums with any wash. Soapy J's express car wash open seven days a week. Let us help keep your car or truck clean at Soapy J's. Soapy J's on the Cumberland Gap Parkway, Middlesboro. Welcome back to the show. Let's get started. The 2014-15 Lincoln Memorial University athletic season went off with a bang when the LMU men's soccer team rolled over former Gulf South Conference sister member Alabama Huntsville three to nothing in Columbus, Georgia to get the year started. The victory would be the first of four straight to open the year for the LMU men, including sack victory over Coker College to open the home schedule before the Wolves of Newberry College stopped the rail splitter momentum with a 2-2 double overtime tie in South Carolina. The blemish seemed to be one that the LMU men couldn't shake as Mars Hill, Lenore Ryan, and non-conference opponent Lees McCray all handed the rail splitters consecutive losses following, thus putting the LMU men at 4-3-1 at the midway point of the 2014 fall season. After the loss to Lees McCray that opened the month of October, the rail splitters showed new life by capturing a 3-1 win over Brevard in Harrogate, but were again kept at bay when they played to a two-all tie with our rival Carson Newman in Jefferson City. Despite reeling off back-to-back -back wins in their next two outings, the rail splitters were never able to regain the swagger that they had to open the season as they endured uh, one tie and three losses to close the year, including a 1-0 loss to the Lions of Mars Hill University to end the 2014 campaign with a 7-6-3 overall record and a 4-4-3 conference mark. Here to talk about the uh, season uh, for the Lincoln Memorial University men's soccer team is Scott Erland. And Scott, I know that uh, the rail splitters uh, really you know, they, they got off to a great start, but unfortunately, uh, it just, it, there was something that happened midway through this year that, that really just set them back. Yeah, I don't really know what it was. They were great start. There was a lot of excitement. They were getting some, some, a little bit of outside consideration in the national polls. And, and uh, you know, it was really exciting early on. It was one of the best starts since the program went to the national final back in 2000. 
2007, was that 2007? And, and then I think it was just kind of a little bit of a um, roster shakeup. You know, we had Mario Pinto had graduated, and uh, all of a sudden it was like there was a delayed reaction offensively to his absence. Uh, Leo, our, our number one offensive option, was battling some injuries, and uh, it just seemed like it, it became one of those things where L had to juggle so many different options in the in the lineup, and it never really uh, never really jailed like he had imagined, I don't think. And uh, but a uh, nice start. You you were around in 07 when the team went to the national championship down in Orange Beach, Alabama. Uh, in my opinion, and, and having seen those teams play as well as the teams here in recent years, it was clear that once we were no longer fully funded by the conference, when we made the transition from the Gulf South to the South Atlantic Conference, you could see the seasons drop off a little bit in terms of how they finished. He took us to the to the, the top of the pinnacle, you know, there uh, in a couple of years in the mid-2000s. Uh, but when that change took place, it really affected his teams. Now we're fully funded. He's back in a stair step to being uh, a fully funded soccer team. And I think we'll see him back. I, I think we will, too. You know, you, you learned L was always there. He, he was taking the women's program there, too. Uh, you, you remember those teams. I mean, I remember that team fondly. It was uh, just uh, going out and obliterating other teams, and, and you had uh, – uh, ten guys, including the goalkeeper, well, not including the goalkeeper, ten guys that were out there that could score at any moment, and it was it was really exciting. And uh, I think we are getting back that direction, though. There was we had some nice offensive weapons, but like we said, so much of soccer is just that gelling, that uh, coming together and galvanizing, and it just kind of never really happened with that unit this year. A couple of big losses for the uh, 2014 season for the Rail Splitters, including Marcel Barvenitz three-year starting uh, goalkeeper, a couple other individuals who will be key replacements, but uh, inevitably Coach L will have the recruiting uh, season that he always has, always brings in great players, and we really do look for them to be back into the uh, upper echelon of the league as uh, uh, 2015 fall season gets underway. Let's turn over to women's soccer. Uh, unfortunately, the LME women's soccer team wasn't able to duplicate the season opening performance of their male counterparts. The Lady Rail Splitters lost a 4-1 to decision to number two nationally ranked West Florida in their season opening game in the Georgia Classic to kick off the 2014 fall schedule. The Lady Rail Splitters wouldn't capture their first win until the second match of the year when they played uh, Mount Olive to a 2-0 shutout before losing their conference opener to Coker in, their only, in only their third match of the year and then reeling off seven consecutive wins uh, before again tasting defeat. The LME women were unable to maintain the pace that they set early on, however, as they finished the back half of the schedule with a 2-3-1 run that resulted in a 7-2-2 conference mark and a 9-4-3 overall record. The Lady Rail Splitters ended the year against Catawba in the South Atlantic Conference Tournament in a one-all tie that saw the Indians to advance to the semifinals by virtue of a 5-4 victory in a PK shootout that ended the Lady Rail Splitters season. Scott, we saw that one. We were lucky enough to see that one at home on the uh, LMU Soccer Complex field. It was just a, uh, you know, when you look at it as a tie, it really doesn't go into the record books in the NCAA as a loss, but in, in, in terms of what the Lady Rail Splitters were trying to accomplish, the loss in the PK shootout was a devastating loss. It was heartbreaking. It was heartbreaking for everybody involved. You know, for, uh, we were down one to nothing for most of that match, and then uh, Fernando Mayachi scores, I think, in the 89th minute. It was the waning, the waning seconds, really. Uh, so it went from elation, sheer elation, to then we get through the two overtimes, no score, and then we go to the PKs. And unfortunately, you remember how that played out. They make five straight. We make our first four, and Fernando Mayachi goes from – the sheer elation of sending us to overtime to just ends up, you know, a, a shot she probably makes 99 out of 100 times and it just happened to be that one time where it soars over the goal and the uh, season's over. It was, it was unfortunate, but it, it, I think it was an exciting season in a lot of ways for the girls. Somewhat ironic that she was the one that gave us new life, put us into the overtime, and then she missed the shot in the PK shootout that ultimately uh, ended the season for us. Not her fault. Clearly it happens. Uh, that's why they have the shootout. Keepers make saves, players miss shots, but uh, nonetheless, a heartbreaking loss, as you've already said. It was heartbreaking, but uh, she was one of our, if not our best offensive weapon throughout the whole year. Of course, she was the newcomer of the year at the LMU Athletics Banquet, uh, which is which is kind of odd because she was a senior. She only came in for one year, but she was a transfer, and that's just how it worked out. But uh, 
It'll be interesting to see how this team fares next year. A lot of people to replace. You got Rachel Vanoes gone, Nicole McKinney, who's been a four year starter, uh, Brittany Jenkins, a four year starter, a big group to replace, but they've got a sol solid core returning. So, and they had, they had some really nice points of the season where it looked like we had a team that could compete for the SAC championship. Well, Coach L again will be on the recruiting trail. We've seen some of the releases that he's. Uh, given to Scott, and Scott has released those through the LMU Athletics website about some of the new signees, a host of new talent coming in for the 2015 fall schedule, and we look forward to that coming up in late August or early September. Let's turn over to volleyball. For Jenny Michael and the Lady Rail Splitter volleyball team, the 2014 fall schedule was one that didn't back down from any of the region's toughest competition. LMU opened the year on a neutral floor in Evansville, Indiana against number 23 nationally ranked Argonauts of West Florida and fell in three sets before falling to Cedarville 3-0 in the second match of the season and then playing collegiate powerhouse North Alabama down to the wire in a five-set grueling match that turned out to be a loss to drop the Lady Rail Splitters to 0-3 on the year. The tough season opening schedule appeared to have paid off a short time later as Michael and her team won seven of their next eight matches, which included non-conference wins over West Alabama, Belmont Abbey, Flagler, and King, as well as conference wins over Mars Hill, Catawba, and Queens. Like many of the other LMU teams, the Lady Rail Splitters endured high points and low points that saw them lose five of eight matches before winning four straight late season events and then closing the year with four consecutive losses to finish the season with a 12-10 and 10 conference record and a 16-15 and 15 overall mark. Clearly, head coach Jenny Michael was disappointed but realizes some of the personnel lost from the season will be hard to replace. From our roster from last year, we will look very different in this upcoming 2015 season. We lost three seniors uh, who will miss significantly. They all contributed in different ways. We had Miranda Bodie, who was a basketball, um, not transfer, but kind of, and, uh, you know, amazing athlete. And then we have Monica uh, McConaughey, who is just an amazing leader and will be very fortunate. She'll be around the program, finishing up her fifth year uh, towards graduation. And then Allie Beeves, um, you know, can't say enough about that young lady. She did everything that was asked of her, even though sometimes uh, she was reluctant at first. At the end of the day, she always did what we needed to for the team. Um, and, and she did the stuff that you didn't see. You know, she would be here early setting up the net. She'd, you know, do the little things, you know, making sure that the underclassmen remember the laundry bag or just, you know, the intangibles that you can't replace. And uh, we're not going to be able to have likely one person step up and fill the role that she did. We're going to have to have a couple people really step up to replace her. Scott, Coach Michael and her team were hampered uh, from really the preseason with uh, injuries. Uh, they, they really did get on a roll there for a while, but I thought when Casey Mincy went down at the end of the season, it really limited what their options were from an offensive and defensive standpoint. Yeah, and of course that's going to probably be a consistent theme of the show, especially on the women's side, how many of the sports were so hampered by injuries, the injury bug bites everybody, but it, it seemed like it bit us more frequently than any other team that I was accustomed to. But the, the volleyball team, you know, Tone goes down with a torn Achilles in the first practice of the fall, then Rachel Jones is out the whole year, so that's two middles that are gone, uh, really just kind of weakened uh, the roster options, um, and then, and, and, you know, a lot of the key contributors throughout the year early on were underclassmen, freshmen and sophomore. And a lot of times what Jenny has always talked about, Coach Michael, is, is the inconsistency of underclassmen. And that, those, you know, they, they had shot off like shooting stars and then they kind of faded a little bit late. Uh, their production waned and, and we were never able to really make up the, you know, close that gap after that. That can kind of be a double-edged sword though when you look at it. I mean, the, the uh the, the grueling losses that you have to go through in a, in a season like that can pay dividends for you in the next year because now those player, players are uh, tested trial by fire. Uh, not only that, you've had time to rehabilitate injuries uh, like we had with Tone and, of course, with Rachel Jones. And, you know, we all knew what Rachel Jones did in her freshman season. She was, a, a, I thought, a great addition to the squad. They say that Tone is a, a tremendous athlete. So I see some very good additions coming in and hopefully at 100% strength when 15 season gets started. Yeah, I mean, you hope so. You hope that, you know, you, you, we've absorbed enough tough luck on the volleyball team. Casey Mincy, it seems like she gets hurt all She's been hurt at the end of the season every year she's been here, which is she's one of our most important players. Uh, hopefully those, those girls improve another step forward. You know, Kiara Holland had a great freshman year, up for freshman of the year probably at one point. And then 
uh, you know, Brooke Fleeman was great at the end of the year. Some of those underclassmen, if they can make another jump in their, in their next year, and now Brooke Fleeman is going to be looked upon as a leader. And, of course, like you said, it's an interesting conversation about the, the difficulty of the schedule. But uh, trial by fire is right, and they've all been through some of the tougher competition this region has to offer. So next year they should know what to expect coming into the season. We're looking forward to 2015. Again, that gets cranked up in late August, maybe early September. You can check the LMU Athletics website for the schedule and, of course, the start of that uh, uh, year at the helm for Jenny Michael and her program. All right, let's turn over to men's uh, cross country. Possibly the strongest start of any of the fall sports came from the Lincoln Memorial University men's cross country team running in events hosted by Queens University, Center College, Berea College, and the University of Louisville. The rail splitters turned in uh, top four, uh, uh, four top five finishes in their first four races, including a second place finish at the Royals Twilight in Charlotte to open the year. After running to a 15th place finish in the Jenna Strong Fall Classic, the LMU men finished sixth in the 2014 South Atlantic Conference Championship in Salisbury, North Carolina. That was before running 12th in the uh, uh, NCAA regional meet that took place in Montevallo, Alabama to finish the season. The women's cross country team, well, that program also got off to a strong start as the Lady Rail Splitters joined the LMU men at Queens, Center, and Berea, finishing fourth, third, and third, respectively. After 13th place finishes at the Greater Louisville Classic and the Jenna Strong Fall Classic, the LMU women turned in an impressive fifth place finish in the 2014 SAC Championship and then ran to a ninth place finish at the NCAA Southeast Region Race in Alabama. Uh, Again, Scott, it's uh, one of those things that uh, when you look at how those teams fared, uh, you look at, and I hate the term, you look at cross country, and I guess in terms of the LMU athletics that we have on the 17 sports, they're looked at as a lower tier sport, but yet they came in uh, really, and, and I think surprised some teams finishing in the uh, in the better half of the South Atlantic Conference race. Oh, yeah, and you look at the, the men's team, Obviously, the dividends of adding a track and field team were already reaping the benefits of that. They've paid, they've paid it forward. Uh, you, you see Ryan Mecca has proven himself as one of the best runners in the conference on the men's side, and then Whitney Elliott on the women's side has proved herself as somebody that can compete for the championship, the individual championship. Uh, I mean, yeah, it was, it, I think they were by far unquestionably the most surprising team of the fall, uh, both the men's and women's team. To see the women's team finish ninth at the regional meet, that was one of their best finishes in program history. Uh, and, and I think it's going to continue to pay dividends having that track and field program. You can you can recruit athletes that they have they have aspirations to do both to do track and field and and to run cross country. And uh, I expect really big things from both our men's and women's cross country teams. They both return almost everybody that that made any kind of significant contribution to the team. Brandon Ward's gone on the men's side, but the women's re return almost essentially everybody that ran this year. So I, I expect big things, and we maybe to push those the queens and the Mars Hills of of the world, they, they kind of own that that market uh, for the sack that is, and but I expect to see them push uh, push those two teams next year. Jeremy Donahue, of course, at the helm of both the uh, cross country teams and right now at the uh, helm of the uh, track and field squad. So uh, again, they'll be cranked up, and he'll be doing uh, suicide warrior duties uh, in both fall and spring of. Uh, 2015 and 2016. All right, we're going to take a brief break. When we come back, we've got to move into the winter sports, and that's men's and women's basketball. A lot to talk about. Scott Erland's with us, and we'll be back right after this on the Rail Splitter Athletics Report. You make me wear my bike helmet. You taught me never to run with scissors. You tell me to stay away from drugs. To always buckle my seatbelt. And to follow the swimming rules. You're always looking out for me and trying to keep me safe. So why do you keep a loaded gun in your drawer? Here in the garage. Closet. Shoe box under the bed. Where anyone can get to it. How safe is that? How safe is that? How safe is that? You ask them to follow some safety rules. Now they're asking you. In fact, they're counting on you. Never let your gun get into the wrong hands. If you own a firearm and are not using it, please be responsible and be sure that it's stored in a safe place. Remember, always lock it up. For more information on firearm storage safety, visit ncpc.org. You can be a hero by being prepared for an emergency. First, make a plan. 
Call a family meeting to plan for things like how to connect with loved ones after an emergency. There, there. Or your escape route. Payback! I am not fast. Build a kit. When disaster strikes, it's important to have enough supplies to last three days. And don't forget the batteries. Low battery. Number three, know the facts. From blackouts to floods, no matter the emergency, the more you know about it, the better you can deal with it. You're gonna need some upgrades. Number four, get involved. Lend a hand in your community to help others know their role in an emergency. You guys, do you feel this? We're gonna be heroes! You can be a hero by being prepared. Yes! Visit ready.gov slash kids for more preparedness tips. Welcome back. Uh, incidentally, uh, my guest tonight is Scott Erland of the LMU uh, Sports Information Office, and you can catch he and our buddy Adam Haley, who is here of the LMU Sports Network on Monday nights on uh, Monday Night Sports Talk on, uh, of course, WLMU 91.3 FM and on uh, 740 WCXZ AM. Those are our sister stations here in the Sigmund Communications building. That's every Monday night beginning at 6 o'clock till 8 p.m. right here, so do join them. All right, let's move over into the winter sports for first-year head coach Crystal Evans and the Lincoln Memorial University women's basketball team. 2014-15 looked to be a promising and prosperous one to begin the year. That was in the preseason. On November 15th, the uh, Crystal Evans era of Lady Rail Splitter basketball officially began with a big way in Jefferson City, Tennessee, when the Lady Rail Splitters defeated regional opponent Lander University 76-72 in the South Atlantic Conference Peach Belt Conference Challenge. LMU season opening victory was tarnished somewhat on day two of the event when the Pacers of the University of South Carolina Aiken came from behind in the second half to hand the Lady Rail Splitters a 77-70 loss and to saddle them with a trend that would remain with the LMU women for the entire season. Despite winning six of their next seven games that included conference wins over Mars Hill, Queens, Coker, and Newberry, as well as non-conference victories over Lees McRae and Bluefield State, the LMU women would drop five straight to close out 2014 and ring in the new year. The Lady Rail Splitters captured their first win of 2015 on January 14th when they knocked off the Pioneers of Tusculum College 85-80 in the Tex Turner Arena and then backed that win with a 64-44 drubbing of league Wingate, league leading Wingate University in their next outing. After passing the midway point of the season due to multiple injuries and illnesses throughout the team, the Lady Rail Splitters were able to capture only five wins out of their final 13 games and ended the year by losing three consecutive against Carson Newman, Catawba, and Newberry to end the season with an 11-11 conference mark and a 14-15 overall record. After the year, we talked with head coach Crystal Evans about her first season at the helm. Like uh, we laid a great foundation for the future. Um, you know, I feel like just looking back, uh, hindsight being 2020, we got a lot in uh, as far as our system bulk wise, but we didn't get to be as detail oriented as I would like to be. And that's obviously something that we're going to strive for uh, next season. Uh, moving forward, we've got a great class returning. Um, we've got depth in our post players with uh, Josie and Keisha returning, along with Megan and Courtney uh, at the four position. Uh, we've we've got guards coming back, you know, Shay Coker being on the um, all freshman team uh, in the sack, you know, she's returning and uh, we've got Kira Rawls and Brittany Guy and uh, uh, Ross Mathis and, and a few other guards uh, coming in that, you know, I'm real excited about. So I feel like our future is bright, and uh, moving forward, I, I think we're going to be a force to be reckoned with in the SAC conference. Scott, I think it's clear that uh, we've seen Coach Evans can can bring in the talent. Um, you know, getting acclimated to head coaching duties, the the day to day things that you got to do. She it was kind of a trial by fire for her as well. But I think you're going to see a lot of talent coming in here and eventually once she gets them all on the same page, I think this team is going to rise to the top. Yeah, and we had alluded to the injuries and no team has hit harder by injuries than Crystal Evans' team. Uh, they they were really just ravaged. I think at one point in this season we were all really excited about the, the kind of the, the potential of the women's basketball team. They had come in, they had hosted Newberry here, you remember, in early December and absolutely drubbed them and it felt like, okay, we're here kind of a statement win and then all of a sudden Stephanie goes down with that knee injury and never returned. Courtney Cox was out for most of the season uh, with a wrist injury and it just was it, it was just never the same but it was certainly a trial by fire uh, and they 
I think they did perform admirably considering at some points they only had seven, eight players that were even available to play. And uh, just really, obviously a lot to build on. I think, uh, you know, when you look at uh, the injury factor, I mean, I think Samantha Satterley was one of the first that went down. Uh, there was one point after they made the turn at January that uh, when, when, when Stephanie Smith went down as well, that was in the Indianapolis game just uh, on the 20th of December, you know, right before the break. When that happened, I think at one point in time you had five or maybe even six starters that were out of the lineup with, with injuries at that time. And, uh, you know, the fact that they came up with any wins after that is just a testament to what kind of strength she had on the bench. It, it was unbelievable, honestly. Uh, you know, I remember walking in for the Brevard game and seeing that we had, I think, six or seven people warming up. And I, I think I was talking to you maybe. I might have been talking to you and I said, is that, is that all that we've got tonight? And, she, and you said, yeah, that's it. <laughs> That's all we've got tonight. It was amazing, you know, and, and we were kept afloat because we were so good at home. We were finding ways to win at home and just were, honestly, it was kind of on the road. It was, it was, it was a struggle from start to finish, even more so. It's nothing profound to say it's harder to play on the road than it is at home, but, uh, but it was even harder for our, our Lady Rail Splitters on the road than most teams. And, but, you know, it, it very admirable, performed really well under the circumstances, and to even finish around 500, it, it was really unbelievable. To, to especially from us that experienced the full scope of the season. Yeah, a lot of a lot of seniors lost from this year's squad, a lot of talent, and uh, you know, I, again, I think that uh, is a, a strong point that Coach Evans had before she came to the program that recruiting was really her forte, and I think you're going to see some players come in that you might scratch your head and say, hey, how did we get this person at that level? Yeah, and she's got the connections, obviously, her sister being at MTSU and her, her being a, uh, a former assistant at Georgetown, not Georgetown, <coughs> Kentucky, Georgetown up in Washington, D.C., the Division One, and uh, and she brought in some, some really good talent. You know, Stephanie Smith was really her only, her only recruit that was – and she was unbelievable. She was a game changer, and obviously it totally changed the context of the complexion of our season when she was lost. I know that uh, Coach Evans is uh, right now in the midst of getting ready for some camps along with uh, her assistant coaches, and uh, she is still in the process of recruiting for 15-16, uh, and we certainly look forward to seeing the Lady Rail Splitters back on the hardwood come uh, November when they take the floor for the 15-16 season. All right, let's turn over to men's basketball. It was another record-setting year for Josh Schertz and the Lincoln Memorial University men's team. After finishing the 2013-14 season with a 28-3 record, the 14-15 rail splitters reeled off 20 straight wins before falling to arch-rival Carson Newman University in Harrogate in their first loss of the year. The loss would be the rail splitters' only blemish of the regular season, capturing yet another conference regular season title. The LMU men wouldn't again taste defeat until the South Atlantic Conference Tournament Finals in Greenville, South Carolina, when for the second time this year they lost to Chuck Benson's Eagles to fall to 29-2 overall while qualifying for another consecutive NCAA tournament. Despite the setback, the rail splitters were still ranked among the top five teams in the country and earned the right to host their first ever NCAA Southeast Region Men's Basketball Tournament as the region's number one seed. In their opening game of the event, the rail splitters were, uh, power was showcased uh, when they knocked off number eight seed North Greenville University 95-62 to advance to the tournament semifinals. That, however, is where the curse that has plagued the LMU men for the past four years again reared its ugly head, and LMU was defeated by number four seed Mount Olive College 75-55, making LMU's fourth straight year that they have lost in the NCAA region semis. Shirts and the LMU men ended the year with a 30-3 overall record, which included another regular season conference title, uh, the program's second ever number one national ranking, the most wins in single season in Lincoln Memorial University men's basketball history, and another entire season of being nationally ranked without falling from the top 25 as well as numerous other team, individual, and program accolades. Still, falling short of their ultimate goal, Schertz was clearly disappointed following the loss to Mount Olive. That was kind of an Achilles heel all year for us. Uh, you know, was was a lack of physicality, a lack of aggression. Part of that's being young, and part of that may be, you know, uh, a mentality that that we have to to look at. But um, you know, from uh, from my end, uh, I, like I told the guys, I, I think uh, it ends sad for everybody but one. You know, uh, uh, everybody but one team out of 300 uh, loses. Um, I know uh, there's a notion which I disagree with that if you're, you know, not the last team standing that. Uh, uh, somehow, you know, you're a loser or you kind of had your hand in the cookie jar and, and uh, you know, you got caught with that. But 
I, I don't I don't agree with that. Uh, these guys are nothing to hang their head about. Um, you know, 30 and three. Uh, you know, set the conference and school record for wins and. Uh, got the number one in the country and, and won a championship and um, really I thought represented the university very, very well. We're disappointed, obviously, bitterly with uh, how we played today and, um, you know, it was, it was on both ends of the floor uh, that, was, that was disappointing. Like I said, I, we hung in, but uh, we weren't able to, to get any stops in the second half once we started making some layups and some, some threes. Scott, uh, I mean, you know, you see the disappointment, obviously, on the players' uh, uh, hanging their heads right there a little bit. Uh, Josh Schertz, uh, obviously, uh, the tone of his voice disappointed. This this is uh, this has become a curse, really. That uh, I mean, four straight years in the semis. Most teams would give their eye teeth for a, a, a record like we finished with, but ultimately, this team strives for excellence. And and you know, not winning the SAC tournament title, not winning the uh, region title was was not what they set as goals before the season started. Yeah, I mean, it, it was honestly, it was one of the most fun seasons I've ever gotten the pleasure of covering there th throughout the year, but it was also, also bittersweet, you know, to look back on it, you think of the three losses were really tough to swallow, especially that last one. But, uh, you know, at the end of the day, it was a, it was a really another great season, like you had said, a sack single season record for wins and winning percentage and another sack championship. And they, and they really won it, I think, by eight games or seven games or something ridiculous. But, um, it was a lot of fun. It was just, uh, you know, at the end of the year, I think we were kind of living on borrowed time. Coach Schertz had, had alluded to that and and uh, just got a really bad matchup against Mount Olive, who ended up going on to win the Southeast region. And, uh, y you know, obviously, still another year we're looking to make that, that next step, go on to a region championship, which would be the Sweet 16, you know, and that's kind of like just to put it in the context of Division One. And, uh, but, uh, Obviously bittersweet, but still it was an absolute joy to cover that season. I know you probably felt the same way getting to, getting to do the radio call for every single game. Absolutely. It was, a, it was a lot of work. I mean, you know as well as anybody, the tournament was a lot of work to put together and to host, but it was, uh, it was a pleasure to have it there. I think we had the facility for it, and definitely people enjoyed this year's tournament. I think we hit the ball out of the park on a lot of different areas of the tournament. Uh, going back to the actual season, though, I mean, when you look at Mount Olive, this is not a shabby team that beat this rail splitter team. Joey Higginbotham's club captured lightning in a bottle at the right time of the year, but they were nationally ranked all of the season. They were, uh, they were a, a good representative of the Southeast region in the Elite Eight. They played hard, and they took it down to the wire. Uh, when you look at Coach Shirt's team, though, Scott, people ask me on a daily basis, uh, are we going to be able to do next year what we did this year? At some point, uh, you have to ask yourself, when are we going to have that down season? He just keeps raising the bar and raising the bar. Yeah, it's unbelievable. When you look at kind of, you know, there, there's great athletes going to every school now. There's so many great athletes that are raised, they're, from the beginning, they're raised to play basketball. They're, and, you know, you see the new barriers of the world that are coming. The, the Wingate's going to be better. You know, Catawba's going to be really good. And it's just... And, and he's filled with these questions year after year. When he lost to Mario and when he lost Desmond, it was when he lost, you know, Vinny last year, you thought that it was going to be hard to recover. That was one of the best single seasons that probably arguably anybody's had since Church has been here. And then, you know, he loses another All-American in Lorenzo. And it's just one of those things where at this point you just learn to trust Church that he's got, he, he um, for, for my money, he's the best coach in this level at Division II. And, uh, and it just year after year after year, he's get those guys back on track, and and he's, and you just learn to trust him. You know that it's going to be another fun year next year, no matter who we lose. Took me a while to do that, but I agree strongly, and I can guarantee you we're going to have him for another year in 15, 16, and that's coming up in November. The recruiting process has been strong thus far, and we've got a great uh, team that's going to take the court next year. All right, we got a lot to talk about in spring, so we're going to break away again for a timeout. When we come back, we've got the rest of the LMU sports, and there's a bunch of them. Stay with us right here on the Rail Splitter Athletics Report. At Citizens Bank, we're different from everyone else. We've proudly served business communities of Northeast Tennessee since 1912 and have security you can count on. We offer the convenience of internet banking, excellent loan services on various types of loans, cash management, and small business banking at all of our convenient locations in Harrogate, Tazewell, New Tazewell, Bean Station, and Morristown. Visit our website to find out more at citizensbanktn.com. Citizens Bank, no more banking as usual. Equal housing lender, member FDIC.
Maybe he's really focused. Hey, Michael. Michael. Maybe he likes spinning the wheels. Maybe he just loves trucks. Maybe he's just being a boy. Preoccupation with objects is one early sign of autism. Learn the others today. The sooner it's diagnosed, the better. Commercial to residential, from the basement to the attic, Knoxville Drywall can deliver full-service drywall, insulation, and paint contracting. Knoxville Drywall specializes in new and tenant build-outs, drywall repair, drywall grids, metal stud framing, acoustical ceilings, suspended drywall ceilings, and ceiling and wall texturing and painting. Knoxville Drywall also provides wall-blown insulation for existing walls, attic-blown insulation, wall and ceiling bats insulation, and crawl space insulation. Knoxville Drywall Incorporated, serving Knoxville and the surrounding area for more than 56 years with outstanding quality and competitive pricing. Whether institutional case good or architectural woodwork, Nolan Products Incorporated of Knoxville has been serving East Tennessee, Southwest Virginia, and Southeast Kentucky since 1958. From concept to finish, Nolan Products custom builds to the highest quality standards to meet your facility specifications while using only the finest materials available. Nolan Products has been serving and meeting the needs and requirements of general contractors and architects in East Tennessee and surrounding area for more than 55 years. Nolan Products Incorporated, 912 4th Side Street, Northeast, Knoxville. Ten sports to talk about for spring of 2015, and I'll tell you what, we had a lot of excitement. 2015 spring athletics season got underway a little earlier this year than it has in the past. With new rules passed by the NCAA, the collegiate baseball teams throughout the country were able to get their seasons underway before the normal early February starting date. The LMU baseball team was no exception. Getting their annual season opening series with the University of South Carolina, Aiken started on January 30th in Aiken, South Carolina. 2015 was a season of ups and downs for Jeff Sixai and his rail splitter baseball team. After dropping their opening three-game series to USC Aiken, the rail splitters bounced back with a non-conference split against Claflin before taking two of three games in their conference opening series with the Bulldogs of Wingate University. The following weekend, LMU was able to capture only one win in three games with league opponent Newberry, but swept region opponent North Greenville and conference opponents Lenore Ryan University and Carson Newman University in the next three series. Throughout the remainder of the season, it was back and forth for the rail splitters. LMU would sweep non-conference opponents UVA Wise and Ohio Valley University, as well as SAC opponents Mars Hill University and Coker College before the end of the planned schedule. The regular season effort earned the rail splitters the number four seed in the 2015 SAC tournament, but unfortunately, LMU was ousted from the event in back-to-back -back games, falling to Tusculum and number five nationally ranked Catawba in tightly contested battles to end the year with a 24-22 record. After the season, we talked with head coach Jeff Sixai about 2015 and about the players he has to replace. Graduation, um, you know, feel like we got a strong core coming back. Um, pitching wise, we we got all of our uh, top uh, top three this year coming back. Um, really, only lose two pitchers. That's Burleson and, and Morbido, two of our top relievers, though. Um, so, we're going to lose a lot offensively. Um, so we're going to need to, to replenish there, um, but I feel good about where we're at with the guys we got returning on the mound, and they need to get better this summer, and uh, along with the guys we got coming in. So losing quite a bit uh, from an offensive and defensive standpoint, but I feel good about uh, the guys in the program getting better, and also the guys we got coming in. Scott, it was up and down for the rail splitters this year. You know, there are there are people that feel like this might have been. Uh, Coach Six Eyes' best hitting team in the 11, 12 years that he's been at the helm. Uh, but unfortunately, they made an early exit from the tournament, uh, being the number four seed. Yeah, and, and I was at that tournament from start to finish. And, and the, the, that, there was a high quality event. There was eight legitimate teams that could have won it. And, the, and our two games are the only two games that were even really competitive in that whole thing, which is an entirely different story that we don't have time to discuss, probably. But, uh, you know, they, they, they were unbelievable hitting the ball probably one of the best teams in the country hitting the ball or the first through the first month month and a half and then for some reason whatever happened the bats just kind of you know dwindled away a little bit and, and they could never recapture that offense and a lot like what ha coach L was having to deal with he was trying to shuffle the lineup trying to refine that but rediscover that magic and uh and the, you know it never just came to fruition and kind of never rediscovered it and it just the Kind of a strange year, really, and no other way to really describe it. We've seen Six a couple of times go through seasons where he's 
uh, lost, lost, lost a lot of position players. That's the case this year. He's going to not necessarily undergo an overhaul, but he loses a lot of key guys. And so recruiting is going to be a, a very strong aspect for him this year. Oh, and he's already got a nice, a really nice recruiting class. He's starting to see the, uh, you know, the, the benefits of winning that conference championship. Now there's guys that are wanting to come here. They're starting to compete for the upper echelon of that sack. Uh, the sack standings and stuff, and you know, in a lot, in a lot of the ways, what we talked about, how Shirts, you know, that Shirts is always going to be able to, you know, get his team back to that that pinnacle. You know that no matter what offensive weapons Six Eye win loses, he's going to be able to bring him in. He's going to be able to replace him, and in the, the bats will, that will still be swinging, and will still uh, produce offensively next year. Well, while the official season doesn't get underway until late January, early February, you can always catch the Rail Splitters in their fall inter squad series. Uh, they have a World Series that they play on the Lamar Hinton Field. It's a lot of excitement. It's under the lights usually, and uh, it's it's always a, a very fun and interesting event, and that comes up sometime in September or October. So, uh, you know, keep your eyes attuned to the lights in the sky of the night in the Harrogate area for that uh, fall baseball from Lincoln Memorial. Let's turn over to tennis. The Lincoln Memorial University tennis teams were next to get the spring season started. Both traveled north to Richmond, Kentucky, where they opened the year against NCAA Division I Eastern Kentucky University. Although the other new tennis teams were both defeated in their season openers, the match against Division I uh, Eastern Kentucky didn't hurt LMU's season nearly as much as Mother Nature did. Following their February home openers against Young Harris, in which the women won and the men lost, neither team was able to compete again collegiately until a month later due to record amounts of snowfall throughout the tri-state area. When they were able to get on the court again, the Bulldogs of Wingate University crushed both teams in conference play to keep them in search of their first leagues of the year, win leagues of the year win leagues of the year. Eventually, both teams captured those wins, but it was the LMU men that excelled most despite having lost five players from the previous season as they finished fourth in the 2015 SAC regular season standings. But like the LMU baseball team, the men's tennis team was sent home following the opening round with a 5-0 loss to Anderson University's Trojans yet to end the year with a 7-8 overall record while the Lady Rail Splitters ended the season with a disappointing 5-9 record. Several weeks ago, we talked with head coach Benny Collins about this year's efforts, and here's what he had to say. Started out very strong. You know, we, uh, we opened up with the University of Commerce and played Eastern Kentucky, a D1 team. Uh, looked really strong. We played. We beat Young Harris in the same weekend. Young Harris beat the heck out of Carson Newman. We looked really good, and then we had that four or five week all spell with that bad weather and all that snow. And we ended up coming out of that with two of our main players hurt. So uh, you know, we started once we started back. We were snake bit from the from the get go right there. So and uh, we never did really recover from all those injuries, and it was just helter skelter trying to get the lineup in there and get to play through it. It was tough. We lost five seniors the year before. We brought in four new players. Uh, these four new players come in and played at a high level. They were very talented. Uh, you know, I told the guys, I said, our, our realistic goal this year is to make the conference tournament with this basically new young team, and we did that. So uh, they did it. I didn't do it. They they done it. So that that really impressed me that was that made me feel good and we could have won a couple more matches just a few more points here and there but we're going to lose senior will sparks and we're going to lose senior stephan hall these two guys have been uh, stephan's been here five years he uh he missed one year he had a, a medical problem had to go home but anyway uh, we lose those two guys and everybody else will be back uh i've already got one guy ready to sign we've got a spanish guy ready to sign we're going to pick up another player or two uh and so with adding a couple two, three really solid players with the lineup we, we got returning, we will be right there next year. We'll be very competitive. Scott, I think he's going to have a lot of talent coming in for 15-16, but I, you know, I go back to that stretch where that snow kicked in here in the tri-state area. Um, you know, that I think that threw them out of rhythm and they just never really were able to recover. Yeah, and I mean, uh, they, they were affected even worse than all the spring sports, and every spring sport was actually affected pretty deeply by that. It, it made the whole spring kind of so fractured and uh, and strange to experience. But, yeah, they never were really able to recover. Lost, a, uh, you know, had some key injuries. Uh, the women really had a bunch of underclassmen and, and uh, just never really able to get uh, consistent performance from any of them other than Alina Vasilyeva. And then on the men's side, it was just uh, – just a, a whole bunch of new players like you had alluded to. And uh, high hopes for next year for both teams, though, and uh, looking forward to get those seasons back on track and maybe get them on the court consistently. Well, if Coach Collins has strengths, it's teaching fundamentals and definitely recruiting. And 
we know that uh, he'll take his, his end of the recruiting uh, brunt here coming up uh, this summer if he hasn't already signed some key players for 15-16. Let's move over to men's lacrosse. 2015 also marked a new era in Lincoln Memorial University Athletics with the university's first season of collegiate lacrosse. Head coach Ryan Kuhn and his rail splitters played their first game in early February in Franklin Springs, Georgia, and lost a 10-7 decision to Emmanuel, but bounced back to take a historic 15-6 victory over regional opponent Lees McRae in their next outing at home at the LMU Lacrosse Complex. The victory, while both historic and sweet, was no indication of what Kuhn and his first-year program would endure throughout the 2015 season. The LMU men lost their next seven games before capturing their second win against CSU Pueblo, the victory gave the rail splitters a much needed shot in the arm, and including the win with Pueblo, Pueblo the rail splitters won three of their last five games, picking up wins over both North Greenville University and eventually Asbury College to close out the season with a 4-10 and mark. When we talked with Coach Kuhn about his team's inaugural season, he was optimistic about the final outcome. To, to kind of think a year back, I, was, I think I was sitting in the same chair and we we're talking about um, all the things that we want to put in place to, to have this season go forward. Um, you know, you get caught reminiscing a little bit. I mean, to think back a year ago, there wasn't a lacrosse ball to be found, a lacrosse stick to be found, there wasn't a net, there, you know, there wasn't anything. And to see kind of where we were to where we are now, it's been, it's been pretty, pretty special, pretty exciting. Uh, you know, obviously we fell short of our goal uh, this season, but I, I think there's a lot of stuff to, to be proud of, and it was a season of firsts, and it definitely won't, it won't be a season of lasts, that's for sure. Scott, Coach Kuhn is no stranger to starting programs. He did it before he came to LMU. Uh, his kids come out, they play with a lot of energy. Despite the record that they had this year, I mean, I saw energy from them entire game, uh, entire season, uh, and I think you're going to see nothing but this team get better as he brings them out for season number two. Yeah, I absolutely agree. That, that It was a really exciting season. It, you know, obviously for all of us in our office and our in general, we were learning a new sport. And, and you know, people see the four and ten record, and they and they think, oh, it wasn't a great season. It was the first year, not. But the 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 different the margin between them being four and ten and say eight and six was so slim that, um, and it's hard to really put into words unless you were there in a first hand experience. And 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 you know, he brings everybody back. He I think he really surprised and shocked a lot of the people in the conference. They thought that we were just going to lie down and we were going to be, uh, you know, just an easy win, which that wasn't the case at all. We were a team that challenged uh, on a consistent basis, challenged everyone in the conference. And and I wouldn't be surprised if next year we're, we're up there and we're able to maybe make a push for the upper half of that conference and, and make our way in the tournament and see what happens. You got to remember that team consisted of freshmen and sophomore. And, uh, you know, while we didn't pick up a conference victory, I really do see that coming in 2015-16. And when you look at uh, this team and what they accomplished this year, that first conference victory could come a lot quicker than a lot of people think. I think it was either Wingate or Queens. That was a, a, a very close game until late in the contest, and we could have very easily won it. Yeah, both those games were very close. You know, we go scoreless against in the fourth period against Wingate, and, and I think it was a one-goal match. And then, and then Queens, I think we led at halftime of that one. Or, um, you know, and those are teams that are, are already well established nationally and uh, in the conference, obviously. And, and just to be able to make that kind of impact on teams at that level was nice. All right. Again, the season will get cranked up in the fall in off-season conditioning and off-season practice. He will have a minor schedule, but officially a spring sport. we got a bunch of those with the addition of men's and women's lacrosse and, of course, track and field. Let's move over to women's lacrosse. The women's lacrosse team, the 2015 season, proved to be more difficult. Also in their first season of collegiate eligibility, head coach Caitlin Karasi and her Lady Rail Splitters began the year with short numbers and with inexperience as their handicaps. Despite those factors, the LMU women took the field and endured seven consecutive losses to open the university's first season of women's lacrosse before breaking the ice with their first victory on March 24th at the LMU Lacrosse Complex when they knocked off NAI opponent University of Pikeville 8-5 for the win. Unfortunately, the victory proved to be the last for the LMU women as they lost their four remaining matches to end the year with a 1-11 record. When we talked with Coach Karasi earlier this season on the Rail Splitter Athletics Report, she looked back in retrospect in regard to her first season as head coach at Lincoln Memorial. I, wouldn't, I don't think frustrating would be the word for it. It's, you know, it's been exciting. There's been, regardless of the scores of the game or how they've been going, you know, each game we've you know, gotten better and improved and improved on our stats each game. So it's become, you know, 
we're making history as every game goes on, regardless if we win or lose. Well, Scott, uh, Coach Karasi, you know, she came in. This is her first head coaching gig. Uh, she had uh, a tough time recruiting early on, but I thought she got some really good contributions from the players that she had on the team this year and a couple of unusual suspects. Yeah, well, of course, I mean, had more. there were more girls on the team that had never played the cross than the ones that had played the cross, so that made it an incredibly difficult circumstances, but to get that first win out of the way and uh, then to look forward towards a program, you can get some new recruits in and uh, and build off of this and hopefully an exciting future. Uh, without a doubt, you know, you, you you don't get it done overnight, folks. It takes time. And, you know, when you've got a, a program in its infant stages, especially with a sport that's really by and large not a popular sport throughout the, the south region of the United States, the southeast region, uh, it does take time. You've got to get those players. Most of them come from the northern hemisphere, the northeast, if you will. And I think both of these coaches will will do much better in season two, and as far as recruiting. I, I agree 100. percent You know, it, you know, there was obviously some a lot of growing pains for a first year program, more so than we're experienced on the men's across side. But um, you know, to get out there and get her first summer of recruiting and to bring in her own players, and and then to to then she can start really establishing and build. But it's good to get that, like I said, to get that first win out of the way. You don't have to worry about that. You know, we don't have to, it's not something that's going to be looming over the program. You're going to see a lot more numbers coming in for the 15-16 season on both squads. And, and with that, you're going to have a lot more options because you'll have more bodies to go to and more energy on the field that is uh, fresh energy, fresh legs, and uh, more talent. All right, let's turn over to softball. Entering her third season at the helm, Lady Rail Splitter softball coach, uh, Natalie Layden and her team entered 2015 with high expectations against possibly one of the strongest fields of conference and non-conference competition in recent memory. After splitting their season opening series with Trevecca Nazarene on February 11th in Harrogate, the LW women played their next 20 games at neutral sites or on the road and against some of the best competition the Southeast United States had to offer among NCAA Division II and NAI institutions. Entering the last week of regular season play, Layden and her squad were within striking distance of capturing the number two seed for the SAC tournament, but due to the tightly contested conference race, finished seventh in the regular season standings to take a seventh seed in the league tournament. That's when LMU's women uncorked possibly their biggest uh, win of the Layden career. Uh, the Lady Rail Splitters knocked off number 23 nationally ranked Anderson University in the opening round of the SAC tournament with an 8-0 no-hit shutout to advance to the winner's bracket. As luck of the, the LMU spring teams had it, uh, 2000, in 2015, the LMU women's softball team uh, was not immune to that trend. Riding high, the Lady Rail Splitters were in position to move to 2-0 in the tournament and into the driver's seat, but were defeated in Game 2 by Catawba College 3-1 on a walk-off hit to put their lives on the line with an elimination game in their next outing. Realizing the next loss would end the season and possibly send them home, Layden's team put together an inspirational performance again, and the Bulldogs of Wingate were on the losing end of that in a 2-1 to -one decision before LMU eventually fell to the wrath and the payback of the number 23 nationally ranked Trojans in their second meeting of the tournament with Anderson in a 3-2 to -two loss, which ended the year with a 500 record at 24-24. Last week, we caught up with Coach Layden and got her thoughts on her team's effort in 2015 things as far as increasing the regional rep of our program and you know we ended it with a bang in our, in our conference tournament we put up a fight and it definitely wasn't a walkover game by any means uh, you know you look at it you finish fourth in the tournament uh, we've got four teams in our tournament that were also regionally ranked uh, one that we run ruled in it and then you know you look at four teams who didn't make the tournament so overall it was a positive season um, you know, we, we graduated a good class and a good group of seniors who really contributed a lot to our program this year. And, you know, it was nice to see our, our junior college athletes step up and really start to contribute more this year. And, um, you know, we got a lot out of them, especially Megan Tice in the conference tournament. She hit three home runs there. And, uh, you know, our, our junior pitcher, Sam Smith, stepped up and she threw a, a no hitter in game one against Anderson and, and did some really good things. Scott. Uh, team at 24 and 24. We wish they could have done better this year. They had some good, uh, some good outings, but they've got to find a way to sweep those series rather than split. Yeah, you know, you know, they were really short-handed this year. That was kind of the inside joke among the team. They had some injuries and some players that didn't really pan out. And uh, but anyway, you know, they really picked it up at the end of the year. Got on a got on a ridiculously hot streak and carried that into the tournament and, and just became a few pitches away from really from really making that a memorable event. 
All right, we're pressed for time, so we're going to move on. One team that uh, wouldn't be denied a strong finish this year was the Lincoln Memorial University women's golf team. Led by four seniors, this year's Lady Rail Splitter golf team turned in top 10 finishes among the 11 multi-team events in which they participated. Including the fall schedule, the, the uh, season was highlighted by second place finishes in the Anderson Invitational, the Tusculum Fall Classic, and the Pioneer Classic, as well as a number one first place finish in the Southeast Kentucky Invitational held in London, Kentucky. While the LMU women fell short of their quest to win the 2015 SAC Championship, their fourth place finish at the event was highlighted by senior Lindsey Davis earning medalist honors as she was named the overall individual winner of the tournament. With a solid foundation of talent returning next season, LMU head coach Travis Muncy and his Lady Rail Splitters could be pushing for the university's first women's title when 2015 gets underway. The women's team, you know, we're in a slow progression. You know, we finished eighth last year. We've moved to fourth. So, you know, we're right there, you know, to contend for titles from here on out. You know, we're getting the caliber players that we need. We're playing well, in, you know, and, you know, hoping that the golf course fits our, our play. You know, and it always comes down just between a few shots, you know, here and there. And, you know, women's golf is a little more volatile. I mean, if you looked at some of the scores, I mean, some girl might have shot 78 one day, then 88 the next. You know, it, it's a little more volatile than men's golf because uh, just the conditions and, and the way the course plays. The 14-15 season left the highly decorated Lincoln Memorial University men's golf team with a lot of accolades to support. Led by three uh, conference decorated veterans, the Rail Splitters posted 11 top 10 finishes, including first place performances in the Tusculum Fall Classic, the State Farm Intercollegiate, and the Tennessee River Rumble, and were the favorites to win this year's South Atlantic Conference Championship in late April. As luck would have it, the LMU men endured what many of the other Lincoln Memorial University teams did this season, as they turned in a lackluster performance and tied for fourth in the event. The LMU men lose two of their top performers to graduation, but return a host of young talent that is expected to pick up where this year's team left off, putting the rail splitters right back at the top of the upper echelon of the men's programs throughout the league. Now, let's turn over to lacrosse very quickly here, as, or I'm sorry, to uh, track and field as we're pressed for time. We don't want to leave anybody out. Although they competed in more events than originally expected this season, the newest additions to the Lincoln Memorial University Athletics Departments, the track and field teams, were originally supposed to have participated in only the long distance categories. With several late additions to both rosters and the addition of several dual sport athletes, the 2015 LMU track and field teams each finished seventh in their first conference championships. Most who anticipated this team's efforts this year never expected the teams to do quite as well as they did, and the season's final outcome may be a prelude of things to come in the future, if that's not redundant, to the LMU Spring squads. Uh, with the addition of, the host of, uh, of a host of athletes next season that will focus more on the field events, the LMU men's and women's track and field teams could already be making their bid to push for a future South Atlantic Conference Championship. And Scott, uh, you know, we, we, we've talked golf, we've talked uh, uh, softball, now we're talking um, uh, track and field. So many sports to keep up with in the spring. How do you guys do it down sports information? Uh, I don't really know. I think I, I think I just black out and then just kind of, and then I wake up a couple weeks after it's over and then I, uh, I'm amazed that I made it myself. Especially, it was already hard enough, and then you add lacrosse and you add track and field. Of course, track and field was a little easier to handle this year because of the, uh, just it was a pretty transitory program. It, right now, it's not a full-fledged program, but they really surprised this year. It was really fun kind of to, to watch our progression. They got some really nice athletes that are, that are going to be fun to watch for the years to come. But uh, to answer your question, I don't really know how I make it. I just, uh, now I'm here, I don't even know how we made it to May, but we're here. Never being a runner, I'm kind of looking forward to the field events. You know, the stuff like the shot put, the discus, the javelin, if you will, the pole vault. Mm -hmm. There's so many things. I, I don't like the sprinting categories, you know, the 100 meter, the 200 meter, uh, even the, the 800 meter. I mean, those are events where you see just sheer speed showcased. Yeah, yeah, no, and you see it. And then you talked about the field events, you see power, power, explosiveness, and, and you know, all those things. And, and uh, I'm, I'm looking forward to it myself, too. Scott, we've got less than 30 seconds. I want to thank you for joining the show. It's hard to believe 14, 15 is behind us. I know. It's crazy. Uh, it's been a whirlwind year, as it always is. And looking forward to another one. No doubt about it. But before we look forward to that, or we're going to take a break. Uh, and I'm talking about for the summer. So we'll see you again in 2000. Uh, 
Uh, 15, that's August when we start to show up again, and we've got the 15-16 season ahead of us, and we certainly hope that you've enjoyed this season of Lincoln Memorial University Athletics. For everybody behind the scenes of the Rail Splitter Athletics Report, I'm Rusty Peace. I'm Scott Erland. And this has been the Rail Splitter Athletics Report. See you in August. <laughs>